How you doing, everybody? Hi, Jeff and Watts Nichols and John and Abdul. Hi, Abdul. Orange Hand, Big Sal. Hey, Dominic. Oh, okay. Got to ask you the question. Um, is the sound and video okay? Let me check something over here real quick. Make sure that... Okay, that's all right, too. Got to check all of my instruments. <laughs> Doing a free, uh, pre-flight check. Hey, Rancher. Okay, anything, sound, video, or good? Okie doke. Um, let me see here. Oh, I'll get them out later. <laughs> Too big of a hassle. What I wanted to talk about today is, is, is something that is, is sort of like, well, I got this watch. I really like it, but I never wear it. Now, I've got some watches like that. Either I never or rarely wear, uh, and but I want to keep, but for different reasons. Uh, for example, I have my perpetual regulator that I got brand new from Hong Kong for 200 bucks. And I, I just love that watch. I don't wear it very much, but I want to have a regulator and, you know, every now and then I'll wind it up and play with it, but not very often. It, it's, uh, and it looks good, I think, uh, but just one I never wear, but I like to have. Another one on sort of the other end of the spectrum is my um, FP Journe Resonance. Now, I just love that watch, and mainly I got it because I'm so fascinated by the phenomena of resonance and how F.P. Jorn basically using tips from Abraham uh, Louis Breguet, how he got it sort of doing that. And I'll wear it every now and then, but it's got really small, two little small <laughs> um, dials on it, and, and it's hard to read. On the other hand, this one's got a big old dial on it, and it's easy to read. That's eh, not always the easiest one because it's got very creative kinds of um, of time numbers on it. And so here's, here's I suppose, the dilemma. I had this one watch that I had for years and really liked it. I absolutely never wore it. And so I thought, well, I'll sell it. And I did. And I did very well on selling it. This was one of the watches that I got with with that plus money i'm putting away for another watch that i'm uh that i have so i guess um the 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 question is that you know what do you do it i mean there's it's very easy to see something you want and say you know i'm getting rid of this watch even though you wear it every now and then or you like to wear it uh, and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about ones that are like real case queens that you never wear or almost rarely wear. Um, and then there are the ones, like I just mentioned, the ones that you're not going to sell for whatever reason, even if you don't wear them too much. So let me hear your your wisdom on that. And what do you have to say? Uh, how you doing, Tim? Good to see you. Um, <laughs> half your pieces, huh? Um, Hey, Tim. Patrick, how are you? Good morning to you, too. Phenomena. <laughs> uh, same here as well. I have a couple of vintage pieces that I rarely wear, but I managed to get them down to four pieces. All the rest I sold. Yeah. Hey, least time. How you doing? Um, how are things in Hamburg? Uh, seller's market uh, at the moment. So now is the time. Yeah, that's true. Very true. Uh, now is very much of a seller's market. Hi, Canadian Watch Monkey. Good to see you. Andy Candy, how are you? Um, ordered uh, the So Heritage Petite Seconde from Jonah's shop uh, during um, the BF sale. Good for you. That's Now, that's, that's the kind of watch. You don't have to spend a lot of money on. You got a cool watch. You can wind it up. You can wear it, and 
you know what I do with it, uh, that watch? I'd get a I'd get a cool uh, band for it. You know, that, not necessarily a real expensive one, but a cool one. I, you know, maybe I'll do that. <laughs> um, hey, John, what do you think of Mont Blanc? Oh boy, <clears throat> that's a good question, and I'll tell you why. Mont Blanc is a a brand. I think they're owned by Richemont now, if I'm not mistaken. And they're, um, they have interesting movements that somebody else did. Um, their Minerva movements, I think, are, are amazing ones. Uh, but not all of them are that way. Mont Blanc is, is one of those funny ones. I, there's something about them I like, um, which, is, which is interesting because I'm not crazy about Mont Blanc pins. But I, I do, there's something about their watches that I like. Um, years ago, God, when was it? 2011, maybe, which now was 10 years ago, they won the uh, sports award at the Grand Prix. And the watch they had was, uh, I know, it was either, no, it wasn't sports. It was, maybe it was sports. I'm not sure. It was either sports or um, travel, one of the two. And they had this sort of this world timer. And I've always been tempted to get it. It's very inexpensive. It's called, I think, the Star World Timer. And, um, you know, just sort of a cool watch to have for a, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd think about it and yeah, maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. So there, there's my opinion. Well, you can see it's sort of wandering around. Hey, Mark, how you doing? How are things in New Zealand? My goodness. Must be, let's see, either very late at night or very early in the morning tomorrow. Oh, my goodness. Just discovered the Zenith uh, Fusi and Chain Drive. Those I haven't seen. Um, most of the Fusi and Chain, if I don't <laughs> get going, um, I'll miss out on, on some that I know are available. Uh, the sky that I know has some uh, pocket watches with Fuzi and Chang's. He bought a whole bunch of them. And I was going to go uh, see him about it. He lives up in Massachusetts, but I didn't because of the pandemic. And, you know, you get, man, I tell you, pandemic makes people lazy. I just don't want to move anymore. I don't want to drive, you know, 50 miles or anything like that. Um, oh, wow. 364. Oh, boy, that's a good deal. Uh, least time. <laughs> Way to go. Hey, Andy Candy, I, I want to show part of you see in my collection. Uh, uh, had a white gold LUC to know, sold it, and now bought a LUC Carreras. Yeah, you know, this is something you can do right now if, if you're smart about it, Andy, and you, apparently you are. Is It's a good seller's market, but there's some good deals out there. Um, that a lot of people overlook. <laughs> They're the best ones. Hey, obese tuna, how you doing? Orange hand, let me see. Depends on the reason for not wearing. If it doesn't work as a daily wear or as vintage, that makes sense. If you don't want to scratch a modern steel sports watch, then get it get over it. <laughs> Let it go. Yeah. You don't want to you don't want to scratch your watch. Well. I don't know. It's like a new car, man. I tell you, you're just waiting for the first scratch or the first nick or something. Uh, I guess it's the same with watches. Um, I don't know. This this guy, this one is um, Roger Dubuis Simplicity, believe it or not. I thought it was a uh, Excalibur when I got it, <laughs> but, but it's, it's actually, but it looks like a um, Easy Diver. You know, it's 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 a funny kind of watch, and the more I wear it, the more fun it is. And one thing I noticed because of the way the Roman numerals are, if I turn it a certain way, it looks like the the dial is loose in the case and shifts one way or the other. Um, you know, so that's sort of like a thing. And this is the kind of watch that I'm not going to worry about. You know, uh, go out and do a lot of different things and not have to worry about it. Uh, you know, I wouldn't take out my, um, for example, I might go, there's I've got these boards on my shed that need replacing. I go out there and bang it up, put some tar paper around it to keep it for now. 
And uh, but you know, if I had on my resonance or any of my my FP Jarn or H Moser or some of my really good ones, I wouldn't wear those. But with a watch like this, one way you get to wear it a lot, or you do wear it a lot, is that you can sort of bang around and not have to worry about it. Uh, I think a good question is, are people panic buying or bargain buying in their seller's market? I don't know. That's a good question. What what I think, my this is just my opinion, I think they were sort of, uh, two things happened. One, the pandemic, you're sitting at home and you're, you know, you got all this money, you're not going anywhere, not spending anything on gas. Yeah, that did accumulate. Um, so people have a have some money set aside, and watch uh, collectors being irresponsible because of some DNA in them. They'll go out and buy something. They 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 feel a need. <coughs> so the other part of it, though, I think, is if you see something going up, I mean, like, let's say you're in the stock market and you see something starting to go up, you want to get in on that before it, you know, takes, I don't know. Uh, that's, that's maybe part of it. I think that's a terrible reason to buy a watch uh, because you're scared of losing out on something. I, I think if you, if you find a watch you like, just be patient about it. it it's um, that usually pays off pretty well. Hey, Zizus. Um, Okay, I had my Ebel Chrono opened up for service. The 7750 has one of the nicest pack uh, perlas, but hidden by, by solid black. <laughs> black. Most, most most of us don't get a chance to enjoy our perlas. Uh, I keep my watches that are uh, hard to harder to find. Uh, if it's re relatively easy to find, I am more likely to let it go at the right price. That makes sense. I've got one that I never absolutely use, and I'm very tempted to sell, especially now because I think it would, I think it'd do quite well. But you know, it's sort of like, boy, that would. Do I really want to do that? Even though I, you know, I've. Yeah, that's another thing too. It's sort of like if you have a watch for a while and you really enjoy it, and the one that I just sold, I really did enjoy it. I wore it a lot at some point but it, then at some other point it just faded uh in terms of use and everything else and i thought well this is the time to sell it and i did and that worked out okay i haven't missed it in fact i haven't missed any of the watches i've sold i mean they were i enjoyed them while i had them but it's sort of like okay you know um that was great but you know it's not like chewing gum you don't want to chew up a watch and spit it out but rather it, it's something sort of Sort of, uh, you know, this is not what I need right now or anymore, and this is something I really would like to have. There was a watch that I that I spotted uh, at a really good price, and I thought, ah, you know, when I get get a chance, I'll I'll sort of maybe have a little extra. I'll, I might uh, go for it, or if I sell a watch and have something, that thing disappeared. But see, the thing of it is, I'm, you know, there's no point in panicking about it. Uh, it's gone, it's gone. It doesn't mean it's never coming back or some even better deal would come back. So that that's another thing I, I don't worry about. Like, oh my goodness, if I don't get it right now, I'll never get it. That's usually not true. It, it's maybe true sometime. Um, yeah. Okay, let's see. Rather, uh, you can't always get what you want, but you some but you try sometimes. You get you get a insert brand here. Yeah. By the way, hi Mark. How you doing? Um, I have no idea what FOMO means. <laughs> I had my Speedy three twenty one that I couldn't uh, wear as scratching um, the down on the bezel would be like taking out 5k and uh setting fire to it hold uh patina at 861 wear without worrying um fear of missing out 
Thanks, Rancher. And uh, Mark Rowley, that is a good point. It's a very good point. I mean, some people are that way. Gee whiz, if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. It's sort of like not wanting to miss a party, so you're not going to study for a test. Then you go to the party, and it wasn't all that much. <laughs> you, know, you go and you flunk the test, and now you're in real trouble. Uh, I, yeah, I think the fear of missing out is is something that, you know, if you have, uh, gee whiz, there, there's so many things that I've missed out on that I, I find out I really haven't missed. Um, Lamania for the W. Um, boy, all of you guys know about, <laughs> about FOMO. That is cool. That's, that's, uh, that's a new one to me. Um, 23 Skidoo. Hey, oh, Tuna, what's up? If you try something, you get uh, what you need, the Rolling Stones. Well, you know, the Rolling Stones are still alive. If the fact that Keith Richards is still living <laughs> is, is sort of really ruins all of the anti-drug <laughs> messages. Um, buy two, one to rock, one to stock. Well, now that... <laughs> well, there's... There's a lot of uh, orange and there's something behind that, but probably not what you're thinking. Okay, um, let me sort of with a related, not related, somewhat related, I guess. And I, and I sort of wanted to ask you guys about this. Um, I've been running in to more and more uh, instances where you have a really famous watchmaker. Um, who uh, Soki, for example, in Japan and uh, Viennese Halter in uh, Switzerland and even Kerry Boot in London. What you find is that you find a watch for sale and it's like, well, let's see, you see a, a what, $20,000 for uh, Kerry Boot in London. And, you know, you're tripping all over yourself to go buy that watch. Then you realize the watch is by, you know, Elmer Fudd or somebody like that. And uh, Carrie Root and Lana just did the dial. And I've seen more and more of that uh, lately. Um, oh, what's his name? Uh, e Arad or something like Arad, E R A D. Uh, there's some company that has it with uh, VNE Halter. And the way I found out about it was I, I was uh, looking at some watches at an auction and I saw that name come up. I thought, well, I'll go check it out. And then I find out it's really, a, I don't know, Elmer Fudd <laughs> version of the same thing. What are your opinions of that, of sort of the, sort of like um, putting a label uh, on a, you know, a fancy label on a shirt that's, you know, made in a sweatshop and, you know, Timbuktu or something. Okay. No opinions. Okay. Um, all right. Um, well, let's see what's coming up. Anything coming up uh, that we should know about? The I recently, in fact, just, what's today? Uh, yesterday. Hi, Richard. Uh a teeny Schwartz makes a watch with the Vooten Lana and dial. Yeah. Okay. Good example, Richard. Um, here's the thing. Oh, God, I'm going to say it wrong. A teeny Schwartz is really a pretty good watch <laughs> in and of itself. Uh, I was looking at some of those movements, and that is a sweet movement they have. And the. Um, MES 111, and then the ones that are sort of based on that. And that, uh, you're right about that example, but that is sort of strange in this respect. Here you've got a, a, a what appears to be a very good watch brand, and the at, at fairly reasonable prices, I might add. And then you put this name on it, and you add $10,000 to it. Now, you know, for the collector, you know, all you got to do is look at that, um, the Atene Schwartz, and you realize it's not a, it's not an $80,000 Kari Vooten, Lana, and Vin Jade, but
but rather it's this other thing. And it sort of, to me, may actually hurt the brand itself uh, in, in this respect because it's got a name without substance, except for the decoration. I will say this in that particular watch, Kari Vutenlanen has won, I think, more than one of the Grand Prix awards, not for movements, not for uh, complications, but rather for artistic, uh, artistic dials. And he's very good at it. He has some amazing things on that. <coughs> but uh, I don't think that he is is sought after primarily as an artist, but rather as a watchmaker. Uh, what are some other thoughts on it? anything? I mean, is this, this something that you guys might, uh, might go get? Hi, Mark. How you doing? Um, not a good business practice. Sort of, Dominic, I, I guess that's sort of my opinion too. It, unless, is there, it, what, um, Asoki in uh, Japan has said, I forgot the name of the brand that has, so he did the dial, I think. And then this is sort of like design the dial and then have, you know, somebody whose job it is to decorate dials, use that design or simply have it, you know, stamped on. If you have that on there, you end up paying a lot for, you know, like a sort of a signature. Uh, the signature makes it more valuable, but does it really add to it? I've got a couple uh, Matisse uh, prints that are signed, and the you know, <laughs> you know they're, they're okay. <laughs> does that really change anything about the the fact that they're prints and not originals of some sort? And you know that that sort of is that sort of thing. Yeah, but. They're, they look like I want them to look, uh, but they're, I don't know. That's what, that's sort of asking you guys about it. You know, I, I, here's what I think some people may get the sense of is that it, it may be a knockoff. Ah, you got a knockoff, it's not, but it's not a knockoff. It's something else. I think the price should represent the value, but uh, I guess the value will be decided by the masses <laughs> and who is ready and willing to pay the price. Price is whatever the dumbest punter <laughs> will pay. <laughs> I think you're right, Watch Nichols. <laughs> what the God? It's sort of the, you know, um, yeah, I, there are things, I bought watches for really pretty good prices in, in certain venues. And I've seen somebody pay a lot more for it than that. Um, this is an example. I got a great deal on this watch, but you know, the same time, the same watch was being advertised as, you know, three or $4,000 more. And I'm thinking, well, you know, it's the guy can get it. Good luck. <laughs> but that's the way. You're, you know, it's not necessarily the dumbest, but it's it's the right idea. Um, the greater greater fool action theory, yeah. That it it sort of reminds you of the joke about the um, you know the uh, two people uh, walking in the woods, and here comes a bear, and so this guy starts running, and his friend says, "You think you can outrun a bear?" He says, "But no, but I can outrun you." That's <laughs> that's sort of like, oh, okay. Uh, surprising to see almost uniform, un unknown uh, manufacturers supplied movements to big brand names like Chanel. Yeah, yes. This is a, this is boy. That's such a good point, John. Chanel has two really uh, fantastic movements. Uh, one is the, it's called Chanel One. And ah, one of the best watchmakers in the world, uh, I forgot his name, uh, was involved in the development of it. Now, this is what Chanel did, which I think is just plain stupid. Um, they said, oh, well, you know, our, 
our our watchmakers, you know, who <laughs> Larry Moe and Curly were there, or they were working on it, you know, and then so and so came along and sort of helped them out. It was the opposite. And rather than saying, we got, oh God, I forgot his name. We got so and so, one of the top watchmakers in the world, to design this watch and help us put it together. Why they don't do that, I don't know, John. That's that's a great point. The other one by Kinesi uh, in the J12. I forget I forgot what the movement name is. I think it's Kinesi. Maybe it's Kinesi 12.1 or something like that. Now this is really interesting too because Kinesi is sort of a a deal uh, is a watchmaker, a movement maker for uh, Tudor and Chanel got together and they own it and they uh, they're and they're building a new factory or they built a new factory in Geneva on land owned by Rolex. So that's sort of an interesting thing. And then of course Chanel owns what 10 or 20 percent of FP Jorn. Lots of you know and great time to say, look, this is who made this is who made a watch. If I made a watch, I would on the back on the dial, I would say this uh, movement was made by so and so, as opposed to we don't know who made it. <laughs> it's Swiss made or something like that. That just it's just sort of it's better to put nothing, you know. It's you know why not put look we don't know anything about making movements you know we design dials or our uh, cases or something like that really wish they would do that and I, and I think they shoot themselves in the foot for doing it because they looked at you know it's Chanel though uh, you know most people see Chanel as a luxury brand and the last thing you want to do is claim that you're making movements when you're not and I uh, Maybe you did hire some guys who were just at a woe stop, and you know, I don't know. Hey, Richard, yes, uh, Romain Gatier, he designed the Chanel exactly. Thanks, Richard. Hi, old oil money watches. Uh, when I go camping, the, uh, the bears hide their food. <laughs> yeah, oh man, we. we've got right now, we have so many bears, the bears in uh, where I live. Are all getting ready for their uh, hibernation. Apparently, they just eat everything. Um, so, hey, Jonas. Well, luxury items uh, and great value don't uh, match very well. Yeah, uh, they can or they don't have to. I mean, you have on the one hand, Jonas, you got something like Van Cleef and Arpels, but you got great luxury items, and then they have great movements. So, you know, and they go out and they get someone, and then they also they. They sort of dribble out, like, where the movement came from. Oh, it has a movement. <laughs> it's like, yes, we went out and we got the very best, because they usually do. Same with uh, Fabergé. You know, you, you hear Fabergé, you don't think great watches and great movements, but they have some, and they've won awards for it. And it's usually because of the great movement. I, I, I really wish they would do that more. Hi, Least Time. How you doing? Uh which nomos, if my sweet spot normally is 38, I hear that nomos um, were quite large. They could. Um, you know, 38 to 39 millimeters, you had to find a nomos that'll do that. If, 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 you, if, if they were large, maybe you can go for a 36 and see what happens. Hey, Truman, uh, can you see, right, for Tudor, uh, Norcoin, 20% by Chanel. Hey, how you doing, man? Thanks. Yeah, full disclosure. What? Here's the thing. is that they act as though this is going to kill them. It's like, oh, if we tell the truth, everyone will know we don't make, you know, here they've been making perfumes and foo-foo for years, and suddenly they want to get into the watch business, and but they want to tell, they want people to believe that they've got really the top watchmakers. Yeah. All they got to do is, 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 you know, really feature the watchmakers. You take, like in book publishing, if they got a good author, they're going to feature the author. I, I just got a book the other day, and they had the author at the top, great big letters, and it's because an author I happen to like. And, um, you know, the book company didn't say, like, you know, 
all the words fell in there somehow. And so we got a really good book. It's crazy. Um, I have 36 millimeter Nomos club and it wears amazing subjective. Uh, never knew the, uh, Inventors who were behind ETA 7750 Zenith 400. That's a good point, John. Yeah, you know, the, the um, what was it, uh, Val Juice 7750, it, I, I think it'd be worth waiting. You know, a, kind of must be about five or six years ago, maybe more. Uh, Vassaron Constantin surpassed Patek Philippe in having the most complicated watch from 1900. To 2000, uh, from 1900 to 1989, uh, El Ra had the most complicated watch, and then Patek Philippe made the most complicated watch. And then I think it was in 2013 or thereabouts, um, Vesseron Constantin made the most complicated watch. Then the year after that, or a couple years after that, there were these three watchmakers who worked at um, Vesseron Constantin who won a Grand Prix award as, I don't know, for, you know, making that complicated watch. I forgot the name of the award that they had for them. But I agree, you know, you know, it, it, it's like, it's, it's like the book business, the book uh, publishers finally realized that people would buy certain authors over others. Hey, Lee Stein, what's up? Um, Hey, I see. I think uh, Blanc Payne made the most complicated watch at some point. I don't think they did, Andy. Um, at least not before, maybe before 1900 they may have, uh, but not between 1900 and now, because those are the, the other three were. They may have done something, though. I personally don't like Chanel, Chopard, and other luxury uh, brand watches, but I own Chopard LUC, so I can't judge them. Well, Chopard is using ETA movements the LUC is something else yeah this is um i like chanel watches i would love to have one of their watches They're the um the moon it's called monsieur something like that it's got jumping hours at six o'clock beautiful watch and and of course i know what you know the movement was uh by um ah he had it up here for me i forgot what it was already but the, the, the point is, is that I think the big mistake that a lot of people make is that they hear luxury brand like Chanel, like Hermes, like a lot of these other ones, and just assume, well, you know, that, that's, a, that's a luxury brand, doesn't count. Uh, and that, that's no longer true. Some of the most interesting, some of the most innovative movements have been in the uh, Hermes line. The uh, Suspendu, the um, now there are a bunch of other ones they had. The movements were not by, <laughs> or the the complications were not by um, Hermes, and oftentimes they weren't even by Vacher, who Hermes owns twenty five percent of, but rather they were by Egonor, who put it, who made the complications for them, and that's why they won awards and things like that. Hey, Mark G. Uh, sentiment on most beauty brands, but Hermes and Bulgari are our counterpoint. Uh, Bulgari, there is a really, 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 really good buy. I was just looking at them before we started to, uh, this morning on the Bulgari. It's called the uh, Octo Roma. Let me see. Yeah, it's the, uh, the Octo Roma. They're under $4,000. At brand new, I saw I, I saw one at Joma's shop. They have the BVL 191 movement, which is a, uh, a Bulgari movement. Great deals. What happened was that the Finissimo, which I think is a lot thinner, uh, sort of everybody wants one of those. But the Octo Roma is has is really good. Also, too, the Octo that this came really was was. Um, uh, Gerald Gentis contribution. He was the guy who had that. So that's another thing. See, this is the thing about it. This is why I, I, I think Bulgari just squandered the talent of 
uh, especially of uh, Daniel Roth. He was working for him for a year, didn't enjoy it. Uh, it, it was not a it was not a good thing for him. Uh, Tark Chaudhary, that's the one. Chanel Monsieur, it's a cool watch. I agree. Um, Piaget, Piaget is another one. Let me ask about this. Um, Piaget, um, yeah, now Piaget is, is, has this about them. Um, they, Richemont owns them, and they started making movements at Val Fleurier. Now, the, the base movement they have was, I think, the one developed by Carol Caspi, somebody or other, uh, when she was at Chanel, and she was running a movement uh, bunch at Chanel. She won the Watchmaker of the Year, which is not too many people have ever won that. So you have this really good movement, and then Val Fleurier uh, has taken over the production of it, and it's used by Piaget, uh, Cartier, and sort of, if they will even tr begin to admit it, in the bottom level, uh, the entry level, Vesseron Content 1056. And that thing, I think, is that's sort of their entry level around 12,000, which isn't cheap. But people act as, oh, well, it doesn't have a, uh, um, a Geneva seal like all of the other ones in Vasseron Content 10. So is the Vasseron Content, and, and by the way, too, Vasseron Content 10 claims that in their entry level 56, the movement that's used, they actually, you know, did a lot to it. Uh, when it, when it, I guess I both showed up from uh, Val Fluier and they got their hands on it and said, you know, this isn't good enough for us. Uh, the most complicated watch is the one you have to explain to your wife. <laughs> yeah, that's the most complicated. Uh, okay. Um, holy smoke, we, we went over time. Did I did I miss the message? Okay, guys, I've got to go. Um, the new viewers now is a part of the show where Bill hits himself repeatedly in the face with a frying pan. <laughs> Neff. Okay, thank you all. Uh, we're gonna have this. We're gonna talk about some of these things again at uh, four o'clock. Thank you guys for coming and putting up with me. <laughs> so I'm glad you did. And um, We'll see you later.